great to be here in Saks Baja at Switchpoint. They often say that uh, computer scientists only really care about three numbers, 0, 1, and n, when n tends to get very large. And so um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about that. And I, one of the things that such dramatic oversimplification sometimes provides is the kind of astonishing insights like the one I had back in 1987. Do you all remember 1987? Greed was good, junk bonds were king, and zero was the most important and biggest number on Wall Street. Why is that? Because zero drove all those arbitration, arbitration equations, right? Because both sides of the arbitrage are supposed to add up to zero. But that arbitrage is really a special case of the zero-sum game, a theory that was promulgated by all of the respectable business schools of that day. Now, um, as far as that zero-sum game is concerned, it, success was not just about winning. Success was making sure that everybody else lost. And you were not forced to like those rules, but you were damn sure forced to accept that that was the only way to play the game. Back in 1987, I rejected those rules for two reasons. Number one, every respectable business school that I applied to rejected me. <laughs> Secondly, I realized that zero was not the only number in the playbook. Consider this. The Earth gets 120 petawatts of energy from the sun every year. That is 120 followed by 15 zeros. It's about 8,000 times as much energy as the entire population today generates at our current industrial scale. 120 times 10 to the 15 is a really big N. And when I realized that, that the power that this sun delivers is enough to not just sustain life on Earth, but to produce abundant, almost limitless possibilities every day. And when I realized that, I realized we're not living in a zero-sum world. We're living in a positive-sum world where there is this abundance of opportunity. So I, I looked at how the rules of the positive-sum game were different. And Although they seemed absurd given the context of 1987, I had the confidence that something could be done. And at this point, I perhaps should thank some of the folks who taught me mathematics and logic and theory. I had an opportunity to learn how Kurt Gödel put together his famous incompleteness uh, proof. And some of you may have read Gödel Escherbach that explains how Kurt Gödel took these leaps, these logical leaps, into seemingly senseless places to ultimately show that any system of logic capable of proving a proposition true or false was necessarily incomplete, meaning that there are true things that cannot be proved, or inconsistent, meaning that there are things not true that are somehow provable to be true. And perhaps it was that result that gave me the confidence to venture into that great unknown and to take these concepts that seemed so absurd by themselves in the zero-sum context and formulate a completely new way of seeing things. The results that I derived happened to agree almost perfectly with the GNU Manifesto. The GNU Manifesto was written by Richard Stallman, who founded the Free Software Foundation and uh, was the original uh, leader of the GNU project. Now, the GNU Manifesto was a polemic, and when Stallman railed against software hoarding, I had simply derived that excluding willing participants from an effort was an exercise in self-defeat. When he talked about the moral imperative of sharing, I recognized 
that free redistribution was a frictionless way to achieve market share. When he talked about the importance of community, I recognized that a vibrant marketplace of people having problems and people solving problems created more rapid and more relevant innovation. I was so convinced by 1989 that a business based on free software and sharing could reach a billion dollars a year in revenue that I founded Cygnus Support in 1989 to prove it. Red Hat acquired that company in 2000, and we have grown convincingly through that billion dollar a year uh, number as of this year. But we are not the only winners. The founders of Facebook and Google and Twitter have all said that they could never have started their businesses without the abundance and the capability of open source software. So there are many winners. And, uh, and open innovation uh, leads to dramatic results beyond software. There's some other interesting things happening in 1989. In 1989, uh, Harold Varmus shared the Nobel Prize in medicine for their discovery of the cellular origin of oncogenes. Now, some of you in the medical field might know what that actually means. But he uh, continued on to lead, under the appointment of Bill Clinton, lead the National Institutes of Health from 1993 to 1999. And there he had a tremendously successful career, increasing its funding from $11 billion to $16 billion a year. I met him in Kyoto at a conference called the Science and Technology, Technology and Society Summit in 2006, and we talked about open access and open data and open source. And he told me uh, in that uh, conversation that of all the things he did since winning the Nobel Prize, the one he felt was most important because of its long range and wide reaching effects was to spearhead the open access to medical research information. A year later, he gave a speech, which I found uh, lightly transcribed on the web, and he quoted as one of his inspirations, uh, or maybe he found this for his speech, a uh, quote from a guy named Panzini, who was the uh, librarian for the British Museum of Science from 1837 to 1866. And this is what Panzini said. I want a poor student to have the same means of indulging his learned curiosity, of following his rational pursuits, of consulting the same authorities, of fathoming the most intricate inquiry as the richest man in the kingdom, as far as books go. And I contend that the government is bound to give him the most liberal and unlimited access in this respect. Now, you can imagine that when Harold Varmus saw the World Wide Web for the first time, he instantly recognized its potential for revolutionizing the dissemination of scientific learning and understanding. He recognized that there was almost uh, an axiomatic equation uh, linking together advances in information and communications technologies that would lead to a fundamental shift not only in individual human productivity, but more importantly, in the capacity of the entire community. He said that this uh, digital uh, commons would allow uh, medical science to rise above the strangulating effects of the so-called Gutenberg liabilities of traditional publishing. In 2000, uh, he, Patrick Brown, and Michael Eisen co-founded the Public uh, Library uh, of Science, which in 2010 received over 20,000 journal submissions, of which they published almost 10,000 with an annual budget of $13 million, which very closely tracks to their stated goal, which was to make it possible to publish a journal article for $1,500. 
Now, $1,500 may sound like a lot of money if you're talking about, uh, if you compare that to putting a classified ad in the newspaper, but um, let's compare that to the traditional publishers. Elsevier publishes 250,000 articles in 2,000 journals, and they have a $3.2 billion revenue stream at a 36% profit margin, okay? That means that it costs 10 times as much to publish in an Elsevier publication as it does in the Public Library of Science. Now remember, Varmus was not so concerned specifically with the individual cost of publishing the article, but what happened when those articles uh, uh, created barriers to uh, participation, to reuse, to scientific progress? So uh, I'm gonna skip a little bit and say that I read this wonderful book this summer, Common as Air by Lewis Hyde. You might be familiar with his great writings about the gift and uh, other books, but in this book, he talks about how scientific diffusion worked in the days of Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin could discuss his novel theories of, um, of lightning, for example, and he could share that information with his scientific colleagues across the Atlantic, uh, you know, with a, about an eight-week latency. Well, in true zero-sum fashion, the guys on the other side who are so interested in controlling information not only don't want to play by our rules, they don't want to let us play by those rules either. <laughs> and in an effort to placate that, Varmus proposed uh, allowing a six-month lag uh, between the date of appearance in another journal and allowing online dissemination and sharing. This, for him, was a bitter but pragmatic compromise. Why bitter? Well, it takes three times longer than in Franklin's days to actually diffuse <laughs> scientific knowledge. So the, um, the result of this, obviously, has been a tremendous rate of progress within the open innovation community. Today, the Public Library of, of, of Science, PubMed, PubMed Central, and 38 other databases integrate data at the rate of of millions and tens of millions of components at a time, all through an easy to use open source interface called Entree. These allow not just the reading of articles, but the connection of programs that can link together uh, this data to help us understand what we know, and more importantly, what we wish we knew about how our own source code actually operates. The connections of these databases uh, are leading to amazing new innovations. And the National Institutes of Health open access policies are the gold standard by which every medical research uh, facility, I've talked with many heads around the world, it is the gold standard by which uh, everybody uh, operates. Today, the National, uh, the National Center for Biotechnology Information uh, services a million researchers 1.8 billion queries a year, and people are downloading data at the rate of four terabytes a day. That is the power of open access. But as I said, not everybody wants to play by these rules, and they want to stop us from doing it. Earlier this year, uh, uh, written by the traditional publishing folks, a bill went before Congress called the Fair Copyright in Research Works Act. And in that bill was language that said, no federal agency may adopt, implement, maintain, continue, or otherwise engage in any policy program or other activity that causes, permits, or authorizes network dissemination of any private sector research without the prior consent of the publisher of such works. And two, requires that any actual or prospective author or the employer of such actual or prospective author um, assent to network dissemination of private sector work. Now, I ask you this. What does scientific publication mean if the public has no access to the data? Remember, we're the ones, the taxpayers, who spent $28 billion to develop this research. Should we allow some private entities to basically claim that they deserve their billion dollars in profit and we deserve no access to what we originally paid for. So I want to warn all you guys, you know as well as I do, bills in Congress are like zombies. 
right? And so we must be, it was defeated by the same wave that sunk SOPA and PIPA, but we must remain vigilant. So let me close by basically saying, think about these two games, the zero-sum game, the positive-sum game, and compete those two in your mind. Which game is the better game? The one that limits resources, that closes out access, that encloses the commons, or the game that invites all of us to learn the rules and play? And now I'll finish with my final number, number one. Gandhi said that whatever you do will be insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. You are the one. I am the one. I've been doing open source software now for the past 25 years, and what I've been able to add to the community, what others have been able to add one by one, day by day, year by year, has created billions of lines of open source software, hundreds of millions of copyrightable and shareable artifacts. What we have done is truly amazing, and I look forward to what we do in the next 25 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>